Good evening, aspirants. I welcome you all to the Hindu Daily News Analysis brought to you by Shankara Yes Academy for the newspaper dated 15th of February 2023. Displayed here are the list of articles that we will take up for discussion. Now we will start with the first article discussion. Look at this text and context article. It talks about the discovery of 5.9 million tons of lithium reserves in Resi in Jammu and Kashmir. It is believed that this discovery will be a game changer in India's transition to a green economy. According to the article, this will help advance the Indian government's plan of EV penetration in private cars, commercial vehicles and two and three wheelers. This is the crux of the news article given here. Now in our discussion today, let us see about the significance of lithium, the geostrategic concerns and the environmental effects. Before that, the syllabus relevant to this discussion is highlighted here. You can go through it. Now let us start with the significance of lithium and after that we will see the significance of the discovery. Firstly, lithium ion batteries are used in wind turbines, solar panels and electric vehicles. So it is very crucial for a green economy. Now coming to the significance of this particular discovery, according to World Bank study, the demand for critical metals such as lithium and cobalt is expected to rise by 500 percentage by 2050. The global electric vehicle market is around 823.75 billion dollars by 2030. This amounts to a compounded annual growth rate of 18.2 percentage from 2021 to 2030. This is the global scenario. Now coming to India, in India the compounded annual growth rate is projected to reach 23.76 percentage by the year 2028. So considering this, India is working to secure its critical mineral supplies and build self-sufficiency in this sector. Now, what is the current scenario? The current scenario is that India is importing all its lithium from Australia and Argentina. Apart from this, 70% of the lithium ion cell requirement is imported from China and Hong Kong. This being the case, the discovery of lithium reserves in Jammu and Kashmir is expected to boost the domestic battery manufacturing industry. And this is the first significance of the discovery. Secondly, the discovery will help advance the Indian government's ambitious plan. Know that the plan is to penetrate electric vehicles by 30% in private cars, 70% in commercial vehicles and 80% in two and three wheelers by 2030. Thirdly, the discovery will strengthen India's national mission on transformative mobility and battery storage as well. Fourthly, the discovery helps us address the geostrategic concern that is prevailing. The geostrategic concern is the dependency of countries on other countries for critical minerals. As of now, most of the countries are dependent on China for lithium and other crucial metals. Know that China currently controls 77% of the global lithium ion battery manufacturing capacity. So this is considered as a energy security risk because China may use this dependence to control the market for lithium. This has already happened in the case of semiconductor manufacturing. So the countries like USA, Canada, India and other major economies are trying to come up with alternative supplies that will decrease the China's geopolitical dominance in lithium. India was also pushing for a rare earths mission to exploit the country's critical mineral reserves. So this particular discovery will help India to overcome the geostrategic concern. India has one more concern as well. It is the growing geopolitical rivalry. We have territorial and border disputes which has escalated recently. Now this is about the significance of lithium and its discovery. With this information, let us see what are the environmental effects. Firstly, know that extraction of lithium from hard rock mines requires the process of open pit mining. This will be followed by roasting the ore using fossil fuels. The environmental concern here is that this particular process consumes 170 cubic meters of water and this will also release 15 tons of carbon dioxide for every ton of lithium extracted. Secondly, the open pit mining, refining and waste disposal from these processes will degrade the environment. 
Other effects include depletion and contamination of waterways and groundwater, diminishing biodiversity and considerable air pollution. Thirdly, stability is also a concern. As we already saw, Australia has the largest lithium stock in hard rock mines. In Australia, lithium bearing pegmamite deposits are found in the ancient geological regions of Pilbara and Ilgan Cratons. These continental rocks are stable for over a billion years. But Himalaya is the youngest mountain range in the world and it is much more unstable. This is evident from the land subsidence tragedy in Joshimath. Know that incidents of land sinking have been reported from a village in Doda district in Chenab Valley which extends to some parts of Resi, where this new discovery is made. So the stability of the region is also a concern when it comes to lithium extraction in India. Considering all these consequences, the lithium extraction in South America should be looked into. As per the article, India could learn from the experience of South American countries, especially the lithium triangle of Bolivia, Chile and Argentina. This lithium triangle contains roughly half the world's known lithium. As per the article, in 2019, Chile's environmental regulators approved a $25 million compliance plan for lithium miner SQM. This is because of overdrawing lithium-rich brine from the Salar de Atagama salt flat. Again, in August 2022, Chilean regulators approved an updated compliance plan worth $52 million. According to this plan, SQM proposed to work with both the regulators and local communities to address environmental consequences. So what is the lesson for India here? A strong regulatory apparatus that addresses both the environmental and social consequences of lithium mining should be there. It is important because India is starting its new journey in the field of lithium mining. Now before concluding the discussion, let us see the safeguards that India's mining sector have. In the year 2015, while recognizing the local effects of mining, Lok Sabha amended the Mines and Minerals Act of 1957 to establish the District Mineral Foundation. Know that this District Mineral Foundation is a non-profit statutory trust for every Indian district that is affected by mining related operations. The main purpose of this trust is to work for the interest and benefit of persons and areas which are affected by mining related operations. But here also there is a concern. It is said that these DMFs have become a sites of centralized bureaucratic control without any meaningful public participation or accountability. So this also has to be addressed. After saying all this, at the end of the day, reducing luxury consumption and promoting public transport should be an important part of agenda of the transition. Only this will help to address the climate change effects. That's all with respect to this news article discussion. Now we will move on to the next article. Have a look at this editorial here. As you can see from the title, this article says that there is a need to shape a disabled friendly digital ecosystem. As we all witness, the world is moving faster towards the era of digitization. So it is very essential to include all the sections of the society in this process, including the disabled people. See, this article provides us with insights about how to shape a more disabled-friendly digital ecosystem. So, in this particular discussion, we will learn about the points provided in the article. Before that, the syllabus relevant to this discussion is highlighted here. You can go through it. First, let's start with some data points about disabled people as provided in the editorial. The author says that the estimation of India's disabled population in the 2011 census is a gross underestimation. He says this because in the 2011 census, it was estimated that around 2.21% of India's population is disabled. But according to the World Health Organization, about 16% of the global population is disabled. So the author says that if the figure of WHO is applied to the Indian context, it would mean India is having at least 192 million disabled people. 
See, technology has enormous potential to create a level playing field for the disabled people. But at the same time, technology can also play a key role in reinforcing the barriers to the disabled if it is not designed keeping their needs in mind. It is reported that India had at least 750 million internet or smartphone users in 2020. Now again, applying the 16% figure of the WHO here, India is roughly having 120 million or 12 crore internet or smartphone users with disabilities. This particular data shows the importance and need of a disabled friendly digital ecosystem. Now talking about the digitization, today our lives are increasingly led by digital ecosystem. We use apps to order groceries, food, medicine, etc. and etc. Despite this situation, there is a long way to go when it comes to making an app disabled friendly. See, to give you an evidence-based assessment of the problem faced by the disabled people, the authors of this particular article have conducted a survey. It evaluates the accessibility of 10 of the most widely used apps in India and the apps span across 5 sectors. These sectors were chosen based on broad stakeholder consultation with people with disabilities. So these apps include Swiggy, Paytm, Ola, WhatsApp, Telegram and so on. The authors used a set of globally recognized parameters to determine how disabled friendly an app or website is. So based on the number of violations, the authors categorized the level of disability of the apps as high, medium and low. The reports found that 4 out of the 10 apps ranked low while 5 were in the medium category. Only one app was ranked high, that is none other than WhatsApp. This report gives us a picture about the viability of apps in accommodating disabled people. It is worrying, right? The authors say that the report will help the stakeholders to start discussion on digital accessibility, product design and the development process. Apart from this, the report will also help service providers to design practices and processes that will improve the accessibility of people with disabilities. Now coming to the solutions, first is the use of artificial intelligence in the apps. So artificial intelligence will help to automate the accessibility testing process and we can also get feedback from users with disability. This in turn will help the service providers to expand their service to the disabled people. Apart from this, courts across the country are also pushing for the need of accessibility to disabled people across sector. This is seen as a positive sign. Now the app developers are required to accommodate the needs of the disabled people. As we saw earlier, India is possibly having 192 million disabled people. So the apps developed in India should be truly accessible for all people with disabilities. This must be ensured by the government with the help of organizations, companies and civil societies. With this, we have come to the end of this discussion. Now we will move on to the next article discussion. Now take a look at this data point for our next discussion. This data point is related to the marital age of women. As many of you already know, there is a statewide crackdown on child marriage cases in Assam. So in this year alone, nearly 4000 cases of child marriage has been registered in the state. In this context, this data point is published in the Hindu Today. The data point argues that women who are more educated are getting married at a considerably later age when compared with women with less education. Here note that all the data provided in the tables given here are directly sourced from the National Family Health Survey 5. Now let us understand the data provided in the table one by one. Now let's start with the table number one. This particular table shows the median marriage age of women. On the x-axis, the current age group of women who have participated in the survey is given. By looking at the x-axis, we can say that women from different age groups have participated in the survey. While in the y-axis, wealth group in increasing order is given from A to E. And from F to K, mean years of schooling of a women who took part in the survey is given. First, you should be able to interpret the table. Assume these are the women from the age group 25 to 29 and these set of women are from age group 40 to 44 and they belong to the lowest wealth category. So it just means that the first category of women are getting married at a median age of 17.9 and 
this set of women are getting married at a median age of 17.3 now as you try to interpret this data if you notice the difference in the median marriage age is higher from f to k when compared with a to e what does this mean i'll show this to you from the table itself assume there is a woman in the highest wealth category and her age is 25 and there is a similar woman who is of the same age but in the lowest wealth category now if we take this difference we find that it is around 4.9 and when we come to schooling there is a woman who has attended more than 11 years of school and she is getting married at 23 and similarly a woman who has had only less than five years of education is getting married at 17.6 so this is a difference of 5.4 this implies two things one is that women who are more educated are getting married at a later age than their less educated counterparts and second is that the difference between the median marriage age of different wealth group which is shown from a to e is relatively less when compared with f to k this shows that although wealth plays a key role education continues to be the dominant factor in deciding the age of marriage of women the median marriage age of women from the wealthiest households is still lower than that of women who have completed over 11 years of schooling this is about this first table now have a look at the table number two it shows that the median marriage age of women belonging to different caste we can see that women belonging to SC and ST community have more or less same median age of marriage while women belonging to OBC and general category have a relatively higher marriage age apart from this there is rural urban divide as well from the rows F and G we can see that an urban woman who has married at least two years later than her rural counterpart the table clearly shows that caste plays a deciding role in determining the marriage age of women other than caste place of residence also plays a part in deciding women's marriage age from the tables one and two we can see four different factors influencing the marriage age of a woman these factors are education wealth caste and place of residence now moving on to the third and fourth table see both these tables are related to the median marriage age of men now have a look at table three if you can look closely nearly all men who are surveyed had married past 21 years which is a legal marriage age for men but this was not the case with women many women who were surveyed had married before the legal age of 18 other than this all the other things in the table are same as that of women men who are wealthier and with more education are getting married at a later age now moving on to table 4 this particular table gives the caste wise data on the median marriage age of men we can see that it follows the same trend as that of women but when you look at the urban and rural divide here it is very sharper than that of table 2 which shows the same data with respect to women there is nearly a two and a half year difference between the median marriage age of men from urban area when compared with his rural counterpart this is all about this article with this we have come to the end of this particular data point discussion through this discussion we came to know about the major factors influencing marriage age of men and women in india now we will move on to the next article discussion look at this news article it says that Arunachal Pradesh Agricultural Marketing Board organized the Arunachal Tea Festival. This event was held to promote tea drinking among the youth and give a platform for the local tea growers. This is about the news. So in this discussion today, we will see some points about tea and its distribution in India. Now let us start by looking at the conditions required for tea cultivation. The tea plant grows best in tropical and subtropical climate. Here, tropical climate denotes a region which stretches from the geographic zone of equator to the Tropic of Cancer in the north, while in the south, it stretches from equator to the Tropic of Capricorn. Subtropical climate refers to the region present between 23.5 degree north and south latitudes to approximately 35 degree north and south latitudes. So basically, we can say that tea can grow best in the areas present between equator to 35 degree north and south latitudes. 
But here you should also know that all the tea cultivation in the world is not just restricted to this area. In some parts of the world, tea is grown beyond this region also. So this is about the geographical extent of tea cultivation. Within the tropical and subtropical regions, tea grows well in certain kinds of soil and climatic conditions. Now we will see about the soil and climatic conditions required for tea cultivation. So tea requires a warm, moist, frost-free climate for its growth. The temperature that suits tea cultivation is around 20 degrees Celsius to 30 degrees Celsius. Then tea requires an annual rainfall in the range of 150 to 250 centimeter. So the rainfall must be evenly distributed over the year. This will ensure continuous growth of the tender leaves in the tea plant. Now coming to the soil conditions, tea requires deep, fertile, well-drained soil which is rich in humus and organic matter for the ideal growth of the plant. Have you ever wondered why tea is grown on hilly slopes? This is because tea plantations requires even distribution of water without any water logging. Hilly slopes provide proper drainage and this prevents any kind of water logging problems. This is the reason why tea plantations are usually grown on hill slopes. Also note that worldwide tea generally grows in regions within the altitude of 2150 meter. This is about the geographical conditions required for the growth of tea. Now let us see the tea growing regions of the world. See this image, the tea producing countries around the world are given here. You can have a look. Here note that China produces the highest quantity of tea in the world followed by India which is then followed by Kenya. Although India is the second largest producer of tea in the world, the exports from India are quite low. Look at this graph. India is the fourth largest tea exporter. Sri Lanka produces only a quarter of the amount of tea that India produces but exports twice as much as India. Do you know why? Now look at this table. It is taken from the tea board website. Although India produces more tea, tea consumption is also quite high. This is why the government in recent times have been taking steps to increase the tea production. Now this is not any kind of promotion video but I recently came across a video which was posted by Nirmal Pillai uh, which uh, read why Indians drink so much chai. This is not an educational content but it was a very informative content which was given in a more funny way. If you find some time, go and watch it. You will get some insights on why tea became so significant in India. Now we will see about the distribution of tea plantations in India. Have a look at this map. You can clearly see the tea producing states present in India. The major tea producing states in India are Assam, West Bengal, Tamil Nadu, Kerala and Karnataka. In addition to these states, tea is also grown in Sikkim, Dauladar mountain range of Himachal Pradesh, Tripura, Uttarakhand, Mehalaya and Andhra Pradesh. So this is all regarding this discussion. Now we will move on to the next article discussion. Look at this news article. It is talking about the retail inflation trends in India. This article came in the backdrop of the release of consumer price index estimates for January. In this discussion, we will learn about the retail inflation and about the inflation trends in India. Now, first let's start with inflation. Inflation refers to the rise in the average price of goods and services in the economy. So what is the effect caused by inflation? Due to inflation, the purchasing power of money will get reduced over a period of time. Therefore, now we need to spend more than before to enjoy a set of goods or services. Now coming to the term retail inflation, retail inflation is the inflation experienced at the retail shops which are usually the last entities of a supply chain. Retail inflation gives the actual reflection of the price rise in the country. In India, the inflation rate at retail level is given by the consumer price index. Here, the consumer price index measures the changes in the general level of retail prices of selected goods and services. These goods and services are those which are purchased by the households for the purpose of consumption. So with this understanding, now we will understand about the retail inflation trends in India. See, the headline retail inflation in January stood at 7.4%. This is 80 basic points higher than the last month's 6.5%. The retail inflation had steadily decreased over the last quarter of 2022. But again, it is on an increasing trend. 
This is due to rise in food prices, particularly the rise in prices of cereals and dairy products. See, the policy makers are worrying about the increase in prices of cereals. This is because the price rise in cereals would disproportionately impact rural households which spent a large share of their income on food. This situation therefore necessitates further policy actions both from RBI and fiscal authorities. Apart from retail inflation, in January the core inflation stood at 6.23% which is higher than December 6.22%. We all know that the upper bound of inflation is 6%, right? So the policy makers need to address this situation by rising the credit costs and by taking steps to reduce the demands. Otherwise, the domestic consumption will get affected. When prices go high, people generally do not spend much. So this will affect the domestic consumption. Apart from this, the center and the states must take measures including rationalization of GST rates to help ease the inflationary burden on the economy. That's all with respect to this news article. Now we will move on to the next article discussion. Now look at this news article. The managing director of Hindustan Aeronautics Limited has mentioned that the countries like Argentina, Egypt and Malaysia have shown interest in the Tejas aircraft. So in this particular discussion, we will see some facts about the Tejas aircraft. See, Tejas is a light compact aircraft which was designed and developed by India's Hindustan Aeronautics Limited. It is a 4.5 generation all-weather and multi-role fighter aircraft. Being a multi-role aircraft, it can perform functions like offensive air support, close compact and ground attack. It is also designed to undertake ground maritime operations. The Tejas aircraft was developed to replace India's aging MIG 21 years. Now let us see some features of Tejas aircraft. It is a single engine delta wing aircraft. It has a maximum takeoff mass of 13,500 kilograms. India tried to develop an indigenous engine for the light compact aircraft under the Kaveri engine program. But since the development process was time consuming, the light compact aircraft now uses the General Electric F404 IN20 engine. As of 2022, indigenous content in Tejas is around 59.7% by value and 75.5% by number of line replaceable units. The Tejas aircraft can reach supersonic speeds of up to 1.6 Mach. The Tejas currently has three production models which are the Tejas Mark 1, Mark 1A and Trainer. In addition to this, LCA Navy, Tejas Mark 2 and LCA Navy Mark 2 are also in the development stage. Here Tejas Mark 1A is the most advanced version of Tejas. It is equipped with AESA radar, EW suit consisting of radar warning and self-protection jamming digital map generator, smart multifunction displays, combined interrogator and transponder, advanced radio altimeter and other such advanced features. This is all regarding this news article discussion. In this discussion, we saw some important points about the light compact aircraft Tejas. Now we will move on to the next article discussion. Look at this article. It says that the former Maharashtra Chief Minister has asked for a larger Supreme Court bench to evaluate the powers available to the Speaker under the 10th schedule. He said this because the legislators have been subverting or undermining the 10th schedule to bring it down. This is about the news article. So in this particular discussion, we will revise about the anti-defection law. So what is this anti-defection law? To understand this, first we must know who is a defector. See, a defector is a person who deserts one political party and moves on to another political party. So in simple terms, a deserter is a person who switches sides. In a parliamentary democracy like India, when the legislators are frequently defecting, then the stability of the government will be affected. So in order to prevent this practice only, we need an anti-defection law. The anti-defection law punishes the individual legislators who might be MPs or MLAs for leaving one party for another. The Indian constitution initially did not have a provision to curb defection. The 52nd Constitutional Amendment Act in 1985 introduced the 10th Schedule. 
so this 10th schedule has the provision to curb defection hence it is called the anti defection law of india the 10th schedule was mainly introduced to curb the party hopping and horse trading that was happening among the indian legislators to ensure anti defection the 10th schedule has various provisions for disqualification of elected members who defect from one political party to another now let's see what are the provisions for disqualification first a legislator is disqualified if he voluntarily gives up the membership of the political party under whose ticket he came to power secondly the legislators can also be disqualified if he votes or abstains from voting in a house contrary to the direction of the whip of his political party thirdly if the elected member who is not a part of any political party joins another political party after getting elected then he will be disqualified fourthly in case of nominated members if the nominated member joins a political party after the expiry of 6 months from the date on which he took his seat then he will be disqualified so these are some conditions for disqualification also you should know that there are some exceptions to disqualification as well now we will see what are these exceptions first one is regarding the merger of political parties if a member voluntarily gives up the membership of a party as a result of his original party being merged with another party then he will not be disqualified here a merger is said to take place if two third of the members of such a party have agreed to that merger another exception is that if a member after being elected as a presiding officer of the house voluntarily gives up the membership of their party and rejoins the party after they ceases to hold that office in this situation they cannot be disqualified this exception has been provided in view of the dignity and impartiality of the office of presiding officer lastly if the nominated member joins a political party before the expiry of 6 months then he will not be disqualified these are some exceptions provided in the anti defection law finally let us see who makes decision regarding the disqualification of legislators under anti defection law any question regarding the disqualification arising out of defection will be decided by the presiding officer of the house originally the act provided that the decision of the presiding officer is final and this cannot be questioned in any court but this was changed in 1993 with the hikota holakan case in this particular case the supreme court declared that this particular provision is unconstitutional as it takes away the jurisdiction of the supreme courts and the high courts and it further said that the presiding officer while deciding a question under the 10th schedule should function like a tribunal which means that its decision can be subjected to judicial review in terms of shortcomings this is all regarding this discussion in this discussion we covered almost every aspect of anti defection and the 10th schedule now we will move on to the next article discussion now look at this news article it says that the income tax department conducted a survey at the offices of bbc in delhi and mumbai this is because of the charge of deliberate non compliance with indian laws this is the crux of the news article given here first of all let us see some basics about the it department see income tax department or the it department is a government agency that is primarily responsible for monitoring the income tax collection in india it takes care of the inflow of various taxes on behalf of the government of india apart from this the it department is also responsible for enforcing the double taxation avoidance agreements they are also liable to deal with various aspects of international taxation such as the transfer pricing this is what we saw in today's article it department is saying that bbc has violated the transfer pricing rules of india now coming back this particular department functions under the department of revenue of the ministry of finance when it comes to it department you have to know about cbd which is central board of direct taxes this body provides essential inputs for policy and planning of direct taxes in india at the same time it is also responsible for the administration of direct tax laws through the income tax department with this we will see some background about these bodies 
the Central Board of Revenue came into existence as a result of the Central Board of Revenue Act 1924. It is the apex body of the department charged with the administration of taxes. Initially, the board was in charge of both direct and indirect taxes. However, due to the overburden, the board was split up into two in 1964. The two categories include the Central Board of Direct Taxes and Central Board of Excise and Customs. And with the enactment of the Finance Act of 2018, the Central Board of Excise and Customs is renamed as the Central Board of Indirect Taxes and Customs. So as I earlier told, the Central Board of Direct Taxes provides inputs for policy and planning of direct taxes in India. On the other hand, the Central Board of Indirect Taxes and Customs deals with the task of formulation of policy concerning the levy and collection of customs, central excise duties, CGST and IGST. With this, we have come to the end of the discussion. Now we will move on to the next part of our analysis which is practice questions. There are five questions, four questions will be discussed by me and one will be the quiz question for the day. Question number one. Consider the following statements. Andhra Pradesh, Kerala, Himachal Pradesh, Tripura. How many of the above states are generally known as tea producing states? Earlier in the discussion, we saw which are the major tea producing states in India. And these four fall under that category. So the correct answer here is option D. All four states. Question number two. Consider the following statements regarding LCA Tejas. Statement number one. It's a fourth generation aircraft. Statement number two. It is a 100% indigenous aircraft. Statement number three. It is the largest and heaviest among its class of aircrafts. Which of the statements given above is that are incorrect? Statement number 1 is incorrect. It is a 4.5 generation aircraft and not 4th generation aircraft. Statement number 2 is also incorrect. In the discussion itself, we saw that it is not made of 100% indigenous content. Statement number 3 is incorrect. Tejas aircraft is the lightest and smallest among its class of aircrafts. So the correct answer here is option C, 1, 2, 3, because the question is asking for incorrect statements. Question number 3. With reference to anti-defection law in India, consider the following statements. Statement number 1. The law specifies that a nominated legislator cannot join any political party within 6 months of being appointed to the house. Statement number 2. The law does not provide any time frame within which the presiding officer has to decide a defection case. Which of the statements given above is that are correct? Here statement 1 is incorrect. In our discussion, we saw that a nominated member is free to join any political party within 6 months and he would not be disqualified for the same. If he joins after 6 months, he will be disqualified under the 10th schedule. Here statement number 2 is correct. 10th schedule does not specify a time period for the presiding officer to decide on a disqualification plea under the 10th schedule. So the correct answer here is option B, 2 only. Question number 4. Consider the following statements regarding Central Board of Direct Taxes. Statement number 1. Central Board of Direct Taxes is a statutory body which is responsible for the administration of direct tax laws through the Income Tax Department. Statement number 2. Central Board of Direct Taxes is a three-member body consisting of chairman and two members. Which of the above statements is that are incorrect? Here, option 1 is correct. The Central Board of Direct Taxes is a statutory authority functioning under the Central Board of Revenues Act 1963. On one hand, the Central Board of Direct Taxes provides essential inputs for policy and planning of direct taxes in India and at the same time, it is also responsible for the administration of direct tax laws through the Income Tax Department. Here, statement number 2 is incorrect. The Central Board of Direct Taxes consists of a chairman and 6 members. So, totally there are 7 members. Since the question is asking for the incorrect statements, the answer for this question is option B, 2 only. Question number 5. This is the quiz question for the day. You can easily answer it based on the discussion we had today. Read the question carefully and post the answer in the comment box below. Displayed here are the main questions for your practice. Interested aspirants can write the answer and post it in the comment box below. If you have found a video to be useful, like the video, share it with your friends, subscribe to the channel. Happy learning.